Hey everyone, this is Pete, and welcome back to Atari ST A to Z, a series of short playthroughs of Atari ST games, some of which I grew up with and some of which are new to me. Today's game is Gauntlet 3 The Final Quest, a 1991 release for Atari ST, Amiga, C64, Spectrum and Amstrad, developed by Software Creations and published by US Gold. This is one of two games purporting to be the third Gauntlet game, with the other being the excellent Gauntlet the Third Encounter for Atari Lynx. The two games are very different from one another, but both share a desire to expand considerably on the original Gauntlet's formula. Specifically, they're both games designed to play at home rather than in the arcades, and as such they feature more extensive varied quests, more in-depth interaction, and somewhat fairer difficulty balancing. The Gauntlet 3 we'll be looking at today also features a more non-linear structure than its predecessors, allowing you to go back and forth between various sub-areas to solve puzzles and unlock secrets. Speaking with The One magazine in its January 1991 issue, Software Creations Development Manager David Broadhurst said, We were looking for something different, so we thought, let's do something original, something new. We'd never seen anybody do a really good 3D scrolling game with masking before. Most of them are just static screens, generated one after the other, so we decided to do one which scrolls around like one big map. If the name Software Creation sounds familiar, you may have heard it in relation to arguably their most famous game, Solstice for NES. This too was an isometric action adventure, but unlike Gauntlet made use of static screens that you progress between rather than a scrolling quasi 3D environment. ST programmer Bill Barner explained to The One that the isometric scrolling screen was particularly challenging on the platform, noting that the Amiga version really benefited from the system's hardware scroll. Most people tend to expect a lot more from the ST, but really it's just a vamped up spectrum, he said. In the end, it's a compromise between how much memory you use and how fast things can move. Either you make do with simple graphics which take up a lot of memory, or you have complicated graphics which still use up memory, but you manage to take care of it. We've used complicated graphics, but they're being moved all over the place all the time to conserve as much memory as possible. Gauntlet 3 mostly reviewed pretty well when it was released. When The One reviewed it in its April 1991 issue, it awarded it a respectable 86%, though noted that the ST version made some sacrifices when compared to the Amiga version, particularly with regards to its overall speed and the smoothness of its scrolling. Weekly Games magazine GamesX awarded it 4 out of 5, noting that it was a great idea which could have been implemented a little better. ST Format, meanwhile, panned the game with a mark of 48%, criticising the game's speed and noting that they didn't believe the new isometric graphics were as good as the top-down visuals of the previous two games. I always wanted to play this back in the day, as I thought it looked super cool, so I'm excited to give it a go for myself, even if I'm setting myself up for potential disappointment. So let's go play Gauntlet 3 The Final Quest. Okay, here we are with Gauntlet 3 The Final Quest from US Gold. A game I always wanted to try as a kid, um, but which I'm aware might not live up to my expectations these days, but I'm still curious to try it because I think it's intriguing. I think it was a good idea to take the Gauntlet formula and shake it up a bit with uh, isometric graphics and some more characters to choose from. Written by Bill Barner, game designed by Software Creations. Graphics by Chris Collins, Hayden Dalton, Paul Salmon. Music by Tim Follin and Jeff Follin. Double whammy of awesomeness there. Player 1 joystick 1, player 2 joystick 2, or keyboard. For keyboard, unplug mouse and use cursor keys up, down, left, right, spacebar for fire. F1 one player, F2 two player, F3 music on. Press fire to start. Alright, let's do it. Player one, select your champion. So, as well as the the four characters from the original gauntlet, we've got a bunch of extra ones here. So we've got Dracolis the Lizard. Blizzard the Ice other way around rather sorry lizard dracolis the lizard yeah blizzard the iceman magnus the wizard from the original questor the elf from the original petrus the rockman thyra the valkyrie spelled wrong 
Neptune the Merman, and of course Thor the Warrior. Okay, um, I feel duty bound to pick one of the one of the new characters. So let's give Neptune the Merman a go. He sounds like he might be fun. So you press the fire button to begin. And the first level loads in. Eventually. And here we are. Okay. So, gameplay in this is much like classic Gauntlet. You walk around and you shoot and you can perform hand-to-hand -hand combat by walking into things. But in most cases, you're probably better off uh, destroying things from a distance if you can. And you'll see enemies come out of generators and they will keep coming until you destroy those generators. So in the case of these ghosts, we want to break through this bunch of them here, destroy the generator, and then there we go. And then we can walk around, we can gather treasure. Those vines keep popping out of the ground to try and grab us. They will drain our health. Um, that's not as much of a problem as you might think, because um, you start this with a lot more health than you do in classic arcade-style gauntlet. And there's a lot more opportunities to restore it. And the health restoration items are a lot more generous than they were in the original Gauntlet as well. So, although your health does tick down much as it did in Classic Gauntlet, you've got um, a lot more survivability. And your aim in each area is to survive... Destroy as many enemies as you can to score points. Collect treasures. And eventually find the way out. There we go. Well, Neptune doesn't seem super powerful, unfortunately. But, well, we've picked him, so we'll stick with him for now. Now, I think he said F3 should turn music on. I don't know if that happens in-game. No, I guess not. That's a bit of a shame, because the Amiga version of this has some truly excellent music. So it's a bit of a shame you don't seem to be able to have in-game music on the ST version, which is a pity. But... That does mean you get the helpful feedback of the sounds, because the one thing the Amiga version lacks while you've got the music on is any sound effects. Because of the limited number of sound channels, and them all being taken up to do that delicious music. So immediately you can probably see some of the issues described in some of the reviews with the, the speed. It's quite sluggish. It's not super smooth. The shots in particular, you can you can practically count the frames per second on them. But once you get over the initial performance and get to grips with what this game is doing, I must confess I, I did have a little play before I started recording here, just to make sure it worked. Um, and yeah, I've actually found it surprisingly, surprisingly compelling. It is quite simplistic compared to a lot of other games. But there's... This is the genesis of some stuff that comes later in this. Gauntlet has always been credited as the game that basically invented the action RPG genre. And by that I mean action RPG as in Diablo. And that kind of thing. 
And here, that's even more obvious. We've got the isometric perspective. We've got the hordes of enemies. We've got the emphasis on sort of finding choke points for them so you, you can attack them safely uh, while remaining safe from their attacks. And uh, a sense of exploration. So yes, while well, well, the technical aspects of this game aren't amazing, there are the roots of a good game here. And to be honest, as uh, ST players from back in the day will be able to tell you, we were perfectly used to having games that just had sound effects rather than music unlike their Amiga counterparts and yes while it is a shame that we don't get that lovely Tim and Jeff Follin soundtrack while we're playing it's just something you have to deal with and it's not the end of the world Plus, there's always the argument to be made that if you have continuous music in a game, it'll eventually get annoying anyway. Whereas sound effects... Sound effects are pretty much always helpful in giving you some feedback on what's going on. So the sound effects here... Tell you when you're taking damage, when you collect treasure. And they're decent sound effects too. They're just fairly standard synthesized ones from the ST sound chip, but they're they're nice. They're more than just simple beeps and burbles. They've got a bit of I don't know substance to them if that makes any sense i like good sound effects and uh, i've mentioned this on numerous videos in the past before but i have what i think is is a form of synesthesia where i can hear certain sound effects and sort of have kind of multi-sensory feelings relating to them. Like, for example, the sound effects in Castlevania on the NES, I often think sound very juicy. I like them because they... they, 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 they sort of taste nice. <laughs> if that makes sense. And the sound effects in this have much the same sort of feel particularly that picking up treasure sound that's a very satisfying sound it's to do with the sort of the sort of pleasant harmony of the notes that it's playing and the echo sound effect That you're taking damage noise is a little bit strange. But it, it gets the point across. It sounds like an alarm of sorts. And you should be alarmed. So anyway, as you've probably seen, we, we have progressed into another area. We left the first area through a gate that had a convenient sign on it saying way out. And that took us into this next area. Maybe we shall continue our quest. The The plot of this, by the way, isn't super important because it's gauntlet. Um, but it's something like, this used to be a magical kingdom run by a benevolent wizard. 
but it has been overrun by the by the Velcrons, uh, who are presumably going to dominate the world by sticking to everything and helping people who can't tie their shoes to tie their shoes. Um, but yeah, the, the the narrative is not important in the slightest. This is a, a gameplay-centric game where you explore, you find treasure, you score points, you just try and progress as far as you can and survive as long as you can. So yeah, on, on the health thing, by this point in Arcade Gauntlet, I would probably be starting to get low on health, but you'll see with all the health pickups and how efficient they are, I'm still practically at full health, despite it declining tick by tick. And despite taking damage from the weird vine thing and from the ghosts. And plus just touch touching an enemy isn't a guarantee that you're going to take damage. Because a, a whole thing in Gauntlet was the fact that these characters can do hand-to-hand -hand combat as well. By walking into stuff. And so their, their effectiveness in hand-to-hand -hand combat determines how quickly they're able to destroy something by walking into it. And also, presumably, how much damage they take in the process as well. But yeah, there you, you can see I'm still on 9,900 and something energy. Which is pretty much where we started. So yeah, as, as slow and slightly cumbersome as this is, I like this. I think it's it's an interesting game, and it's notably different from a lot of other stuff doing similar things around at the time. Because the norm for games of this style was still very much to adopt a top-down perspective. So the isometric perspective, which you'll see allows for you to actually walk behind things that apparently is one of the most difficult things to program about this that preview from the one magazine said that um in the initial stages of programming it a sprite walking behind something would halve the frame rate <laughs> so they they evidently sorted that out eventually and you'll see there is this sort of quasi 3d effect now you can go behind stuff and it doesn't affect the speed way out let's go into this church and have a look around more ghosts and they said they said one of the ways they got around it was they had certain areas that were very open where you would come under attack from a lot of enemies simultaneously and other areas that were a bit more elaborate that required you to explore and those would have fewer enemies and that would help to that would help to save on on the memory requirements and also help to keep the frame rate up as well and yes i know the frame rate for this probably looks laughable by modern standards but you know, on 16-bit micros, this is not unusual performance. And I've looked at the Amiga version, and although although it does scroll a little bit more smoothly, and it is marginally faster, there's not a lot in it. There's not a lot in it. So... The only thing ST owners are really missing out on is that music, which is a shame. But, like I say, understandable. So you don't have to um, destroy all the enemy generators to proceed. It's just quite a good idea to. And you'll notice there that the 
the sort of quasi 3D effect on the uh, on the perspective is actually better than in some sort of um, some sort of three quarter perspective role playing games that were around at the time, where you can sort of only walk behind the very the very top piece of a roof on something, whereas in here, if you look at this pillar, we can we can go behind it realistically sort of from from down here and we sort of but we bump into the wall of it here but if we go up a little bit we can just walk back and forth behind it so that's actually some some quite impressive well done quasi 3d stuff going on which is quite advanced for the period but like i say software creations also made solstice which is probably one of the most well-regarded isometric perspective games of all time so it's it's not altogether surprising that they'd be able to pull this off the significant innovation that this brings to the table is being isometric and scrolling because that was quite unusual There were scrolling isometric games, of course, although it's probably more accurate to call most of them oblique perspective. If you look at something like Blue Max on the Atari 8-bit or Zaxxon in the arcades. And well, no, Zaxxon probably was isometric, actually. Blue Max was definitely oblique perspective, though. Um, those tended to go in a linear direction and tended not to involve you going behind anything. Ah, it's a wizard. Kill the wizard. I'm getting something other than the ghosts now. There's more treasure to be had before we go down those steps. And yes, long-standing Gauntlet fans will be pleased to know that you can shoot the food. And yes, it tells you off if you do that as well. <laughs> Not in speech, sadly. Not in synthesized speech. But it does warn you not to shoot the food. Lots of treasure to be had here. Okay, I think that's taken care of it. So now we can head down those stairs. There we go. And onwards to the next area. So you'll, you'll notice the ladder is there, so we can go back to that previous area if we want to. That's one sort of notable thing that this this game does it's very different from the original gauntlet the original gauntlet was a, a linear progression of levels occasionally finding a teleporter to skip some levels or i think in some cases there were some levels that some teleporters that did actually take you back levels in a rather mean trick but yeah for the most part that was about just progressing through the levels one at a time and proceeding ever onwards whereas in this what you've got is i think there's six or seven areas sort of regions of the game world and each of those have like five sub areas i think that you can explore between 
Actually, it might be eight because I think there's I think there's one per um, character. It's like each character's home area that you're you're clearing out one at a time and dispatching the Velcrons back to the shoe fastening place that they came from. The tunnel. Take bucket to the well and get key. So yeah, occasionally you get messages like that which tell you to do something. So we pick up that bucket. We're now carrying that, so we need to find a well to take that to. Here's the other exit from this area. And we climb the ladder. And onwards we go. Except, this is actually where we started the game. So we've looped back round and re emerged. in this starting area. There's the well. The forest. Now take the key to the altar in the church. Okay, we know where the church is because we've been there before. And you see all the enemies we killed, they stay dead. Which is nice means you actually have a, a nice sense of conquering each area and making it safe. So onwards through here. And down to where the church is, which is just over here. And back in there. And then we saw the altar earlier. Which is just up here. There it is. Find the stepping stones and cross the river. Okay, so we've now got a time limit. To find whatever that just opened. So that's revealed some stepping stones across the river. Which will allow us to go somewhere that we haven't been before. There's a wizard we haven't killed down there. Unacceptable. There we go. And if we just go down the stairs there, loop around using the little underground passage that we had before, that should take us back to that initial area with the river, which I think is where the stepping stones are. So we've got plenty of time. You see that hourglass is, is draining quite slowly. So we've got plenty of time. And the fact we cleared out all the enemies beforehand means that we can we can just proceed. We're not facing any resistance along the way. And up we go. Excuse 
my phone vibrating. All right, those stepping stones down there, those are the ones we take normally. But there should be some more that allow us to get over there. Gotta be quick. Right, so over those. There they are. So these these weren't here before. And as soon as that hourglass expires, they will disappear again. And there we go. We've finished the zone. Here's some nice bonus points. Level has been completed. This is only part of the realm. You must continue. Press fire. So it then goes on and loads the next area. You shall see it has a completely different look to it. New enemies to encounter. We'll pray for a little bit longer because I'm, I'm having fun here. Oh, they are they are causing quite a bit of pain. <laughs> Let's get rid of that generator as soon as we can. All right, and then dispatch them. Dispatch them. There we go. Find the second key to our next exit. So yeah, hopefully you can see this this has a bit more structure and a bit more of a sort of almost action adventure feel than the original Gauntlet. It's not just well, I mean, it, it kind of is find key to open door, but they, they hide it better with the finding of the items and using the Monsignor elements and so on. So yeah, I, I think I would have had a good time with this back in the day. Ooh, lots of treasure. It's got that nice sense of adventure and exploration that I've always enjoyed in games. And it's rewarding, and there's some, actually some, some variety to, to how things go on. It's not just non-stop shoot the enemies over and over and over and over. There's a nice mix between shooting the enemies and um, sort of looking around. And finding how to progress to different areas. And finding good vantage points to defeat enemies. So that was a shield potion. 
I think it was. So maybe that helps me defend against enemy attacks, perhaps. <clears throat> I think I read somewhere that one of the things I had to change in order to kind of save all the memory they required for all the graphics in this um, was they had to kind of ditch the ability to carry stuff and use it later. And I mean, obviously, it's doing that to a certain extent with the keys and the with the bucket and all the the sort of trigger items like that. But that's sort of that's probably been done with internal flags, rather than having a a variable inventory. Well, if that's the case, it kind of begs the question what the items display on the status panels for. Because nothing we've picked up has appeared in there. <laughs> All right, where is this last key? I think I saw there were some enemies up here we haven't dealt with yet. But how do we get up there? We go this way, I guess. You yeah, see so this time around, instead of the vine, we've got that hand poking out the ground, trying to grab us. Presumably that is a fixture for all of the levels. The thing that just pops out the ground and tries to damage you. Well, that's where we came in. This exit is locked. I guess that's why we need the key then. <laughs> Silence, phone. It's not actually a text message or anything like that. We've got um, we've got like some home security features. One of which is a, a sensor on the back door, but it insists on notifying us every time someone opens the back door. So if my wife goes outside to go and do something in the garden, then uh, my phone tells me as soon as the door is open and when it's closed. We just haven't got around to turning that notification off. <laughs> right. Get away. Leave me alone. Oh, okay. So I guess the I guess the second key must be somewhere else in this zone. And we need to find that in order to open that the exit that was sort of back around by the starting point. Still with these dudes. Lovely stuff. It is getting a bit harder now. We're we're down quite a bit on energy now. 
Oh, okay. Items one. So we, we can carry something. And I would assume those are like the potions in the original gauntlets where they just blast everything on screen. So let's let's give it a try here. I think you press I think it's shift. Yeah, there we are. So that that damaged everything on screen. Don't shoot the food. Told you. I told you. Ah, oh, the pain. Why are they still coming? The generator's not there anymore. Get away from me! Yeah, I I, I see a <laughs> I see a bug there. Them continuing to regenerate once that generator has been destroyed. That cost me. Get out of here. Hmm. Now, where to go next? So that just takes us back to where we came from. Can we go this way? No, we cannot. And now they've stopped appearing. Just had to walk away from them and come back. Oh, these guys are relentless, though. Oh no, I shot the food again. Oh, shoot the food. Yeah, I feel that this level, this level seems to be chugging a little bit more than the, the previous one. It's not unplayable by any means. But it does, it does seem to be struggling a little bit more than the previous one. But yeah, certainly hasn't reached unplayable territory. And as I say, this is not unusual performance for an ST game from this period. Get out of the way. Let me through, I want to destroy your homes. The once you got rid of the generators, they're, they're easy to deal with, but when they, they, when they swarm you like that, you take a lot of damage. food? I'll take it. There's the other key. We 
should save that potion now. Find the third key to open next exit. Okay. So there's more than two keys. Enough! Leave me be! <laughs> I think one thing this could have done with, but was presumably a casualty of the amount of memory it already required, um, is it could do with some death animations for the enemies. Because at the moment it can sometimes be a little bit difficult to tell if you actually hurting enemies or killing them or if there's just a bunch all standing in the same place or stuff like that you can make things a little bit confusing but not to worry for I have a key and I shall use it to escape. I suppose one way you can tell that you're hurting the enemies is your score goes up while you are hurting them. So that, that does tell you something at least. And onwards. We have new landscape. We're away from the, the greenery, the green mountains. Into a sort of rocky wasteland area that's similar-ish to the first zone. But not identical. Fewer trees. Ah, uh, they're everywhere. I think... There we go. That's the time for a potion. Again, would it be nice to have some sort of graphical effect to acknowledge that you're using the potion? Get off. Oh, so many of them. I think there might be a limit to how many can appear on screen at once, though. Which you can sort of take advantage of to a certain extent. Let's do that again. They're still appearing... They're still appearing when their generator's not there anymore. Oh, another key. Find the fourth key to open next exit. Is this it? Is this the next exit? Or we go out here? Ooh. <laughs> Slight error with the, the masking there. You gonna let me under this outcrop? Or not, I guess. 
What about this way? More baddies. More food. Stop killing me. Neptune the merman answers to no one. Die. Oh. Another potion. Oh, and another potion. Yeah, so I'm quite I'm quite pleased with this. I say I, I completely acknowledge how this might look laughable to some of you watching this. Especially when you compare it to, to console games that were happening around this time. But what you gotta remember is in certain places particularly the UK, not everyone had a console. And for a long time, for a long time, people were just continuing on their way with their ST and Amiga. And so when they were playing games, they played something like this. And they were happy with it. As well they should be, because it's it's a perfectly competent game. If you're wondering, there's no DOS version of this. They did consider doing a DOS version at one point, apparently, but um, for whatever reason, it didn't happen. Are we back in the starting area? I think we might be. Let's see if we can go up to that exit that was right at the top and see if we can leave through it now. No, nope. not that way. Oh, we're in this area, I remember. All right, maybe back this way then. Now I think we're back in the starting area. And again, after all that fighting, the eerie silence of a region in which you've massacred the entire indigenous population. Um... Where do we go from here? I'm not entirely sure, you know. Let's look down here. I think this is on the right track. Maybe. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> You're not telling me this is a game where you need to make a map to progress, is it? Oh no, here we are. Can we not exit through here yet? I guess not. I guess I need something else. Alright, I think that's probably a good, as good a place as any to to leave that. Um, yes, hopefully you've got a, a good idea of how that all works. 
and yeah it's it's decent it's it's not a terrible game by any means um i rather like it in fact uh, i'll probably spend a bit more time on this myself but yeah i i completely understand the criticisms that came up in some of the reviews um and obviously if you're going to try this as a modern day player be aware of the of the fact that it is slow it is sluggish um there are sort of classic home micro game design decisions in there but it's decent i would have enjoyed this a lot back in the day i think shut up i would have enjoyed this a lot back in the day i think so yeah a bit of a shame that i i didn't get a chance to enjoy it back in the day because i always thought it looked really interesting in the reviews and turns out it is so that's good isn't it anyway let's leave that there for today as always thank you very much for watching and i'll see you again next time